Your eye is always looking for beauty, whether it's a person, an island, a city, an athlete, a model, a baby bird. You're attracted to things that stir your emotions in your eye. I mean, you just want to shoot. This one was probably one of my favorite. This one right here, I'm not so sure about. And this is a little before my time. <laughs> I don't understand the interest over this photograph. Wow, it looks like Alec Baldwin. I'm not sure if I know how to even say his last name for sure. If I ever met him, I'd just call him Walter. Every picture tells a story. Today, we tell the story of a man who's been taking pictures for more than 50 years. Walter Yost on NFL Films presents. The first day when high school started after I graduated, I remember laying in bed, and I was living with my mother and grandfather. My mother came and said, what are you going to do? Aren't you going to go to school? I said, Mom, I'm going to be a photographer. And she looked at me and she says, that's so gauche, and walked out of the room. This is my father, a bass player. Played with a lot of jazz greats in New York, Dizzy, Billy Holiday, photographer. My parents were divorced. We would do these things on Sundays together. You know, we'd buy, he'd buy, now we, he'd buy tickets to the Knicks games or the Yankee games or the Giants football games. And then I really sort of fell in love with it. I called up Sports Illustrated and told them I had a portfolio. I mean, a very small portfolio at that point. George Bloodgood was the one who sort of opened the door to me. He was the assistant picture editor and gave me spec assignments. I wouldn't get paid, but they processed my film. So I took the train from East Orange to Baltimore. It was my first credential to a Colts game. I love those Colts. And there was a show on, on Thursdays back in the 60s, called Pro Football Highlights, which I would watch religiously every Thursday at 7.30. So I went to Baltimore, and I wore an all khaki outfit so I could see myself on TV that week if something happened. So the minute so left in the game, United throws this pass to Jimmy Orr. And I remember taking one frame, positive I missed it, but far more important to me was, once he fell in the end zone, I was there jumping up and patting him on the back. So that's what's the most important part about this picture. This was the decisive moment with one frame. There was no motor. I had one frame where I just happened to hit the focus on the money. You know, this is the type of picture you take, and they do see, and they believe in you. So my father had given me a, sort of a year and from the moment I graduated high school or, or some point after that to make some sort of career for myself. And if not, I was going to go to Rochester Institute of Technology, the Kodak-driven school in Rochester. I mean, I was accepted. I was ready to go, RIT. And Neil Eifer, who was a great Sports Illustrated photographer, turned down a job. So they gave me Neil's job. And I went to do an AFL game. It was Buffalo Bills versus the Patriots. And this guy, Elbert Golden Wheel Dubinian, Ran back a kickoff like 105 yards. That whole sequence, you know, it's just in the right spot. And the man with the golden wheels takes off. And George Bloodgood, when he showed the pictures to the managing editor, the managing editor supposedly said, who is this Iosis fellow? And Bloodgood said, oh, he's my guy, it's Yos. And from that point on, you know, I started to move into the lineup up there. The thing I remember about Super Bowl I is the hangover I had. The night before, I went to see Smokey and the Miracles at the Whiskey A Go-Go. And apparently, some of the uh, Green Bay players had partied a little that night before, like Horning and McGee. So McGee caught the winning touchdown. I got the picture of the winning touchdown, which went on the cover of Sports Illustrated. So the two hangover victims sort of had a good time that day. <laughs> no more RIT after that. 
Screw RIT. <laughs> I'm sure I would have learned something, but I don't like cold. Up next, Walter's portfolio grows by leaps and boundaries. Sports Illustrated had this idea to embed me with the Cowboys. I remember the first day I went into the locker room. I remember there was a, a tight end, Solly, who came up to me, you know, just said, this must be a pretty important story. And I said, why? He says, because I've never seen another photographer in this locker room. And from that moment, you know, I started to slowly weave my way in with the team. And you start to see them do everything. This was the period when I was trying to get away from action anyways and, and do things that were more personal. Baseball pictures, when players are doing nothing, to me are the best pictures. So, you know, you can't apply that to football. And that's what I was trying to do, is find photographs elsewhere. Those are the pictures, you know, you wait week in, and you see it maybe in week three or four, and then maybe you don't shoot it until week seven, because it takes time to move into each of these players' comfort zones. It's pretty exciting. They just were a team that was everything you wanted to watch. This is before the game in Candlestick Park in the locker room. We were all excited, and I wanted to take the field. That was like so wired up before the game. I like calmed down, and then everything was going right. They were a minute away from the Super Bowl. It was like the perfect call by the magazine, and, and to be embedded with them it was really sensational. It was just the worst thing that could have happened did happen. Cowboys are out of it. It was the most depressing thing that could happen. You follow a team a whole year. And at that point, I didn't know this picture meant anything. I didn't even think about it. I didn't know I had it. Now you go to the locker room. And all these guys you spent the last three months with, you know, obviously getting involved with the team, are sitting there like they just lost their parents in a, in a car crash. You know, all the pads and the tape cut all over, all the shirts piled up in the middle. The saddest locker room I ever, ever had to walk into. Good. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. It's called uh, Sprint. I'm sitting in the locker room in between Wednesday or Thursday practice. You know, we're going to the Super Bowl, so that's kind of all I can think about. And the PR director comes in. He says, I got something I want to show you. And he's all like, you know, smiling about it. I'm like, well, what is it? Show me. And, it's a mock-up of the cover of that catch. I didn't know if uh, mock-up meant it could change before the weekend or what, so I waited until uh, to get too excited about it until I actually saw the whole magazine. Here's the pass of Montana, these two frames here. And then the next shot, of course, is the cover. It was one of my goals from being a little kid. All the guys that I watched on TV or wanted to be like were on the cover of Sports Illustrated. That kind of meant you had arrived. I mean, reaching to heaven to catch that with his fingertips. So in pre-digital, you shoot that on Sunday. When do you see it for the first time? Wednesday or Thursday. And then Sports Illustrated didn't really use the Cowboys' pictures in the magazine because they had lost. This didn't run, you know. The story was just brutalized. Now, I, I must say, I'm still a little pissed off about that. Well, I'm sorry for Walter. I'm not sorry for the Cowboys. I get invited to autograph shows all over the country, and it's pretty crazy. The ones in New York or Philly or Washington, the lines are long because they hate the Cowboys, and they love this photo. They can't, they can't see this enough. I signed one just the other day that these two guys came to the game, they scalped the tickets, and they were in opposite end zones. So the one dude asked me to write, to Bob, you picked the wrong ticket. Because obviously, he picked the ticket in the far end zone. The guy that was there in front of me, he was right in front of the end zone where the catch play was. I like the horizontal version of it, where you can see the limp bodies in the background. 
waiting to see what happens as the ball is clasped by his hands. Sort of like the Jimmy Orr picture, you know, boom, boom, gone. I mean, that's awesome. And everything's in focus. That's, that's the other crazy thing about the catch. It's like in perfect focus. How does he know? Uh... I was trying for a few years. The 50 millimeter lens, with something happening in front of you, 10 feet away from you or 12 feet away from you or even closer. And then it happened. It was a picture of Dave Logan I shot in 1980. It was essentially the same type of picture, but it wasn't the game that was so meaningful in the history of football. So, you know, there was preparation and planning in a certain way for that, because that wasn't the first one I had done. But it was a good assignment. I mean, it, it turned out very good, because of one single frame. It's probably my most famous picture. For that reason, it worked. Well done, Walter. Coming up, the focus shifts from sports to beauty. After I was a part of being on the cover of Sports Illustrated, I would look for his name at the bottom of the photos. And many times he was the guy that somehow got that great shot that nobody else could get. Walter had access to places uh, inside the clubhouse that uh, nobody else had access to. It's luck when it happens once. But uh, when I think of Walter, it was almost as if just go there until someone tells you you can't. I remember the kids were much smaller, and he wanted to capture that, and then convince my wife somehow to actually take part of that uh, photo shoot, which surprised the heck out of me. But again, that lends itself to access and trust. The trust level is so important because these guys will talk. Tiger could talk to Michael. Michael could talk to Charles. Charles could talk to someone else. And if you done anything to cross some barrier they say is wrong you're out but you know what you have to cajole him sometime joe was the king of the nfl and he was going to show up at 4 30. like oh, that's way too early 5 30 maybe we can start to shoot that's what i'm thinking he said well i got it you know i have to meet jennifer you know she's going to pick me up like at, you know six I said, well, you know, this picture's not going to work. And I said, do you want a beer? And he starts to talk about Steve Young and what's happening with the team. And he has another beer. And he's lost track of time now. I said, come on, let's, let's do this shoot, Joe. And then suddenly he realized, what time is it? And I said, it's like 6.30. So I've got to meet Jennifer. By then, I had to shoot. Thanks, Joe. Bye. That's one of the real beauties of photography. There's always a new twist. Neat situations, never the same as probably any you've ever shot in your life. Over 50 years. Sometimes you get good opportunities, sometimes you get great opportunities, and sometimes you know, you're giving almost no opportunity, but you still have to make something happen. And the shot is Ali at his home. This was not my idea to put him on a, a bike. He just came out of his, his barn on a bike. And I said, why don't you just go by the fence? I strobed it, and that was the picture. That was the bad assignment. My rival at the time was assigned to follow the Colts, my team. And they sent me out to do the Jets. And you look in the picture, you see Paul Zimmerman, Brent Musburger. You didn't know what was going to happen, and you didn't know how significant it looks 20, 30 years down the line. You know, you don't know history's taking place often when you're there. This is one of these pictures that as time goes on and history changes in one's life, it takes on a different feel. Who is that? Is that, is that Jack Nicholas? He had on his green master's coat and said, why don't you just put your collar up and put on my sunglasses? Sign of the times, right? 
This tells me that he has a keen sense of awareness about what's going on. And he finds uh, the different pockets of downtime to be interesting. I love shots of, uh, of famous people in rooms where you see the whole space of the room and you get some feel like you don't see them often. The Lakers always stay in great hotels. It's like working in a studio. It's really beautiful. You know, I didn't shoot that many of the musicians when I worked for Atlantic that I really followed him into hotel rooms. My assignments were always go to concerts. And, you know, we became Wilson Pickett's sort of personal photographer, but we never hung out with him in his room. I wish I had, because you never know when something good's going to happen. In a sense, I think I'm more renowned with the athletes because of these pictures of the girl. It's been a good business card. This a whole 30 years of swimsuits, you know, going from the magnificent Petra to the equally magnificent Brooklyn. Walk into a locker room, and some guy will go, you know Marissa Miller? And now you have something that they really want to talk about, hot chicks. You're in Fiji, you're in the Maldives, you're in the Seychelles, you're in Hawaii, you're in Jamaica. We're in Brazil. We were stationed in Manaus in 1977, I guess, or eight. And we had Cheryl and this little Brazilian girl who was really cute. And I was paying, I know I was paying too much attention to the Brazilian girl because the editor was saying, Wally, well, Cheryl's getting upset. You know, please take a picture. I say, okay, fine. I never saw any of these photographs until I bought the issue, took it home with me. Can't escape that picture. We wonder if we get you to look at a couple of photos of her. Of Cheryl Teagues? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, they made me do this. I had her poster up on my wall. Is it in here? This one. Before I got it wet, you really couldn't see through it as much. Duh. But I have gotten letters from people who said, my family canceled the, the subscription because of that photograph. I think that there are others that are more provocative, more athletic, sexier. It's kind of a nothing shot, but there's something there, and I don't know what it is today, that people um, are attracted to, <laughs> to it. <laughs> don't say the obvious. <laughs> The areolas. <laughs> Not very medical. She doesn't look good. She's uncomfortable. There's a thousand pictures better of Cheryl than this. Great eyes, great teeth. I mean, she was just a, a fabulous model. But it's my most famous swimsuit picture. It's a famous, as swimsuit pictures go, it's the most famous. But it's not a great picture. Sweet. That's why you say you never know when something's going to happen. Yeah, I just got on Facebook and I said, this is the photograph that never goes away. And then I got lots of responses. Why would you want it to go away? It's, you know, it, it's fabulous, blah, blah, blah. No, this photograph, more than any other, um, keeps coming back, keeps coming back. I know how to sign it now, so I hide certain things. <laughs> Up next, how to frame 50 years in photography. This was the first day I ever worked for Sports Illustrated and got paid. 17 years old. It did this horrible picture. July 6, 1961. I just had my 50th anniversary. Pat on the back was a weekly feature. A good spot to give newcomers a chance to work. It wasn't as important as the front of the magazine. I mean, this was, this was like the latrine. This was the back page. And this was it, cover number one. I almost don't even remember what I felt. It was so long ago, 19. But uh, my grandfather, I grew up living with my mother and my grandfather. And my grandfather passed away. And I remember going through his, his bedroom up on the third floor of our, our house in East Orange and going through his drawers and 
And when his top draw was my first cover. So that's what I meant up. If you're doing something, you remember it sort of in a normal way. So I think we all appreciate how someone like Walter can bring the, your moment uh, to being a little bit better. I don't know if it would en enhance it uh, and make the actual moment better, but it certainly feels better. It's the night he breaks the record. Reassuring Cal. <laughs> Sucking up the Cal. It makes me laugh. I don't see any uh, thing around his neck that says he belongs there. But I do remember thinking, yeah, I thought you'd be here. Stills, to me, resonate more than any piece of footage, because the film just flashes by. Stills, you can look and look and look at. Huh. Well, the top two are my mother and father, and then taken with a 14 millimeter, held out like this, our self-portrait. Christian, my wife, and Bjorn. You know, it already looks like a, a time far removed for all of us before my grandson was born. He doesn't understand how to look through a viewfinder yet. He likes to take pictures. And, you know, hopefully I can take him on a job one day, like I took my kids. There are the young lads both shooting. Christian, the oldest one, is a picture editor. Bjorn, who now had last year's cover, he wants to be a great photographer. I mean, those pictures, you know, they're special to you. What's your favorite Walter Young photo? Well, it's hard to lay it on one, but this is one. The kids in Cuba, because this is the millisecond that everyone plays sports for, and the joy you get from it. I mean, you can get that joy at any age. To me, you know, if you eliminate the child's heart in your photography and the sport, you know, you've lost part of the real essence of the game. I think this is one. The blue dunk is one. The catch is one. You know, one of those moments you're never going to get as long as you live it. Gone. But I had it history that'll never go away.